The Bible shows us the development of man's redemption. From the beginning of Scripture all the way through the end, we see how our redemption uh, develops, and it gives us a complete and marvelous plan by which we are redeemed, and it shows it to us step by step how all of that works out. You know, God's plan was formed before the world was created. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13 verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of the li- of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. It was known that Christ was going to die. It was all planned before time began. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. God planned to choose those in Christ before the foundation of the world. You know, Ephesians 1, 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The church was part of God's eternal purpose. God knew that Christ was going to be sent to the earth. He was going to be slain. The church was going to be formed. He was going to have redeemed Ephesians 3, 10 and 11 says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Heaven itself was prepared before the foundation of the world. Matthew 25 verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. God's plan is described as a mystery. You know, this plan existed. God knew the plan, but we didn't know the plan until it was revealed. Matthew 13, 34 and 35 says, All these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak to them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Romans 16, starting in verse 25 says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith. To God alone, uh, to God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. This was a plan that was planned from the beginning. This was not an accident like some people, you know, some people will teach Well, you know, God wanted the Jews, so he set up the Jews, and that didn't work, so he came up with plan B. This wasn't plan B. The redemption of man and the plan for it was was planned from before time began. It's always been God's plan to save us and redeem us. So let's walk through uh, this plan of redemption, starting in the beginning and going through the end. The title for this morning is Redemption from Beginning to End. Number one, we see from the beginning that man was responsible for keeping God's laws. God always wanted man to keep his laws, to honor his laws. And from the very first, man was told what to do and what not to do. You turn over to Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely surely die." 
God laid out from the beginning, this is what you are to do. This is what you are not to do. He gave them his commandments. <coughs> but then man disobeyed. We see man's disobedience and we see the consequences that came from that. Uh, you know, Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 17, Adam's, uh, then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, and for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. You know, upon Adam and all men to follow, it brought fear, it brought pain, it brought grief in work, it brought us returning to the dust, and it brought a separation from the tree of life. Chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. There was now a separation. Man was given what he needed to do. He sinned, and the consequences were that we had to now till. We had to work hard to eat. We would return to the dust, and we were separated from the tree of life. We were separated from being with God. In Noah's time, we know that it brought the destruction of all but eight souls. You know, Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them from the earth. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. You know, we had men during that day and age who you know, became so evil and so corrupt that God was going to wipe everybody out. But he saved those eight people and he vowed that he would never destroy uh, men, even though they were evil. You know, he would give us that choice. He would give us that ability. He would not wipe out the face of the earth again like that. You know, but the generations of Noah's sons at Babel showed the continual failure of men to obey God. We were commanded to be fruitful. We were commanded to multiply and fill the earth. But they sought never to be scattered from each other. They wanted to be together. They wanted to create this big, large city with this temple instead of going and filling the earth like they were told to do. God confused their language so they would begin to do what he wanted them to do. We disobeyed again. God gave us this chance, and think about that. Think about that. The Tower of Babel, we're not real far removed from the flood. Yet men continued to do what they wanted to do. But God didn't stop. Secondly, we see a promise that God makes to the fathers. And God now starts to reveal his plan. And he starts to reveal his plan to, to the fathers. And he promises to bring forth a great nation from Abraham. He tells Abraham that uh, he promises to him the land of Canaan. And he promises it to Abraham's seed. Genesis chapter 12 verses 6 and 7. Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem. As far as the terebinth tree of Morah. And the Canaanites were then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. <clears throat> First, though, they had to go sojourn in a land, in a foreign land, for 400 years. They went to Egypt. 
They were in Egypt. And while they were in Egypt, God multiplied their numbers. God blessed them. Even though they were in slavery, God blesses them and creates this nation. And then in the day of Joshua, they finally receive that land. Joshua 21, 43 through 45. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel all came to pass. God gave his promise to the Israelites, to Abraham. He fulfilled that promise by giving them the land. And he promised them, Genesis 12 verse 3 says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 22 verse 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. God promises them to bless these families. This was the gospel preached beforehand to Abraham. Galatians chapter 3 verses 8 and 9 says, And the scripture, for seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, And you all nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. This was preached to Abraham that he would, he would bless all nations. All nations would have this opportunity. The seed by which all nations would be blessed was Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. So this promise that's made to Abraham, this promise that's made uh, to the fathers that all nations would be blessed, all nations would uh, be able to have this gift. Well, now thirdly, we see that God then made a special covenant at Mount Sinai. God makes a covenant with this people. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us. Those who are here today, all of us who are alive. That covenant, that law was made only with Israel. This was a covenant that God made with a select people. This covenant and, and, and the law served several purposes. First of all, it served to sanctify Israel as God's chosen people. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. But then this law, this covenant that was given uh, to the people of Israel was to teach men how bad sin was. It was to teach them about sin. Romans 7 verse 13, Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not, but sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Israel's experience with the law demonstrates the need for redemption from sin. Israel was a monument to the futility of redemption by works alone. What was the old law? The old law was a set of works. <coughs> it was a set of things to do. God told them, you do these things and you are my people. And what did they do? They failed miserably. They couldn't keep those commandments. They couldn't keep what God told them. And as a nation, Israel only survived by God's grace. God raised up judges. They were being oppressed. In Judges chapter 2, verses 8 through 23, he raises up these judges to come and to bring them out of that oppression, take them, uh, deliver them from their oppressors. <clears throat> he provides what they need, but it's not enough. They had the law. All they had to do was, was follow the law. They didn't do that. 
He sends judges to come and help them and deliver them. They didn't heed them. So then what did they want? They wanted a king. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 20. They come and they beg for a king. Everybody else has one. We need one. But their kings could not save them from apostasy, apostasy and captivity. God sent them prophets. The judges didn't save them. The kings didn't save them. He sends prophets to them. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 15 and 16. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. Israel's glory as a nation was lost and they had their prophets that came and spoke to them. They didn't heed them. But one thing that those prophets did say was something better is coming. They preached something better is coming. So look, we've made it all the way through the kingdom of Israel here and we've seen that they didn't make it. They didn't do it. They still needed help. We as mankind still needed help at this point. Well, God here continues to work out his plan. Number four, he repeats his promise to King David. 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Jesus would be given the throne of his father, David. Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Through the son of David, he would be called David's Lord. You know, Psalm 110 verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 through 45. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he a son? Well, we know that Christ would come and he would set up a kingdom that was different than any other kingdom that there was. Daniel 2, 44, In the days of the, these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. He was giving them a new covenant. He's setting up a new plan. He's giving them something different that surpasses anything else that, was, that has been on this earth. This would be a new covenant and it would be far superior to anything else uh, that had come. You know, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 talks about this new covenant. It says, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days. This better covenant. Hebrews chapter 8 talks about it as well. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 13 but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. This new covenant was coming. Something new and better was going to be there. The first covenant didn't work. It couldn't save them. They needed something else. But yet they mourned and, and they got so upset about the temple. And, you know, the temple had been destroyed and they wanted to rebuild the temple. And they're, they're upset because the temple wasn't as great as it was before. God promised that the greatest glory lay ahead. Ezra 3 verse 12, But many of the priests and Levites and head of the father's houses, old men who had seen the temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted for joy. Haggai chapter 2 verses 2 through 9 talks about how something better was coming. The temple would be that much better. God had laid the framework for his plan. God had laid the framework here for the plan to finally redeem man. Number five, we now see in the fullness of time, Christ comes. Galatians chapter four, verses four and five. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Christ came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. He came to bring redemption and salvation. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 28. And he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Drop down to verse 38. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. God has now sent his son. He has sent Christ to this earth. Christ came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Christ came to redeem his people. Christ came to preach good tidings to the meek. Luke 4 and verse 18 and Isaiah 61 verse 1. God was laying in Zion the chief cornerstone. Isaiah 28 verse 16. He was laying the chief cornerstone who would be rejected, who would be crucified and raised from the dead. The old law didn't work because they couldn't keep it. So someone was brought in. Christ was brought in, sent down to earth. He kept the old law. It says he was born under the law. He was able to keep the law. He was the chief cornerstone. He was what they needed to build this new uh, scheme of redemption that, that man needed. He was the one to build it. But they reject him. They rejected him. They crucified him. And they raised him from the dead. Matthew 21, 42. Jesus said to them, Have you ever read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He sent Christ, and the people rejected him. But in Christ, we have now come to the last days. We started back in the Old Testament. We've gone through all of the covenants. Now we come to the last days. Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. 
has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Christ, God speaks to us through Christ. He speaks to us through his Son. Acts 1 verse 8, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come to you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Christ then spoke through his chosen witnesses. So God sends Christ to speak on behalf of him. He appoints his witnesses to be able to speak to the rest of the world. And through their writings, they witness to us today. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. All the things that they wrote, written to us so that our joy may be full. The salvation promised through the prophets can now be received in the name of Jesus Christ. We now have that ability to be redeemed. So number six, God's plan is to eventually glorify the righteous. Christ has come. We have the second covenant. We have the better plan. We now have access to redemption. So now Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. We have been glorified when we are glorified when we obey Christ, when we do his will, when we accept his message. We are then glorified. John 14 verses 1 through 3, Christ talks about that he goes to a, to a place to prepare it for us. He goes and prepares that place for us. John 17 verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Christ wants all of us to be with him in glory. He has gone to prepare that place for us. He wants us to be there. Hebrews 11 verse 16, but now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. God has prepared a city for us. God has prepared this heavenly country for us. The sons of God await the redemption from the body. It's not something that's going to happen with us on this earth. It's not something that's going to happen while we're in our current bodies. It is something that's going to happen when our bodies are redeemed. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 20, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We're told that we will be redeemed. Our bodies will be redeemed. There's coming a day when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. John 5 verses 28 and 29. At that time, it's told to us the righteous will be changed into eternal glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 52 and 53. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must, be put, must put on immortality. Look at this perfect plan of redemption. And let's think about this a little bit. God knew before he ever created this world, before he ever created us, God knew that we would sin and reject him. God knew that we would not 
follow what he told us to do. He created us anyway. God knew that that was what was going to happen. He did it anyway. And he even had a plan already in place to cover our sin, to redeem us from our sin. He already had it in place. And we go through human history and you see as we go through that history that that foundation is being laid little by little by little to create this plan. And now this plan is finally given. And we have that ability knowing that we have something far better if we follow that plan. The Bible reveals God's plan of redemption. And we understand that from sin... If if we're living in sin, that the only thing sin produces is fear. It produces pain. It produces sorrow. Sin causes the corruption of our bodies. It causes the loss of being able to be with God. But if we are in Christ, that we have freedom and we have forgiveness. We have salvation. We have redemption. And we have eternal life. God has given us this great and this wonderful plan. He has given us the blood of the Lamb that can redeem us, that can make us whole, that can give us that peace and give us hope. Hope is not anything on this earth. There's nothing on this earth that can give us hope but the knowledge of heaven, the knowledge of being right with God. Are we the people we need to be? God's given us the plan. He's given us the way out. He said, if you will follow me, if you will follow my will, if you will do the steps that I give you to do, you can be saved. And then guess what? When you're in the church, if you mess up, God says, come to me. Come to me. Repent of those things and we can be whole again. How are we living our lives? Are we living for Christ Are we accepting and taking this wonderful gift that he has given us? Or do we just keep going on the way of the world? Let's be God's people. If there's anything we can do for you this morning, please come as we stand and sing.